Revelation chapter 3. If you're using a church Bible under the chairs, there it will be page 906 in that Bible. If you need that, we encourage you, please follow along. Today, we come to the end of the seven-week study through these seven letters that are written to seven churches that were located in the geographical region of what is modern-day Turkey. Remember, these are the spoken words of Jesus to his churches. Important messages that he himself would have John record on his behalf and then send those letters out to these churches. The church of Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamum and Thyatira and Sardis and Philadelphia and this week's church, those believers in the city of Laodicea. And this is the final message of our series seven. And I believe that this could possibly be the one that is most relevant to us today. Just as we've witnessed in these other letters, Jesus is going to use analogies and phrases that will relate uniquely and personally to these who are living in this city of Laodicea. Of all the other cities, this one is arguably the most important that we understand the history and the culture and the, and the geography and the background behind it so that we could get the intent of the message that is recorded and sent out to this church. If not, then we will surely miss what Jesus is trying to say. In fact, we will likely misinterpret what Jesus says and what his message is, as many have mistakenly done in the past. They've mistakenly interpreted some of the scriptures that we find in the text before us this morning. In fact, I remember vividly as I was going through these notes, I actually looked it up. It was nearly 10 years ago, the last time that I preached over this text. And I remember vividly when I did, I remember my sister walking away from the service feeling as if she had been deceived and lied to her whole adult Christian life because of a faulty teaching or misapplication of this text. Not that the person or people did it menacingly or vindictively, they just did it incorrectly. And I don't want, that, I don't want you to be a victim of that this morning. If we don't know the proper context in which Scripture is recorded, then we will come to the wrong conclusion and miss the whole point and application for our lives today. And so there will be quite a bit of background information, but it's only so we can grasp what is being said in this text. And so I want to go ahead and I want to read the text this morning. It'll be Revelation chapter 3. We're going to begin in verse 14, and we'll go all the way down through verse 22. Verse 14, Jesus says, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the amen. Now, here is Jesus' introduction for those of you who are marking and have been throughout this series. This is his introduction to this specific church. Remember, this is common in each of these letters that he's writing to. These are the, the grounds or the authority that Jesus has to say what he says to each of these churches that he writes these letters to. Whether what he says is a pro or whether what he says is a con, whether it's a condemnation or whether it's a commendation or or criticism, whatever, this is the authority that he has to say what he says to these churches. And so here's his introduction. These things saith the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou were cold or hot, So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh, will I grant this to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. 
He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Perhaps you notice as we're going through this, for those of you who have been with us throughout the extent of this series, you noticed another inconsistency in the outline in this letter. After Jesus' introduction, he skips any commendation whatsoever that he might give to this church because there is none, at least not worth him writing about. And he goes right from the, from the commendation into the condemnation or the criticism of what is happening in this church and amongst this body of believers. It's the opposite of what we studied last week and we saw in the church of Philadelphia where they had no criticism that Jesus wanted to bring up, but only commendation. Not so with the church at Laodicea. By the way, it is no coincidence that the two churches that seem to be doing the best, the most successful, at least in the world's eyes, Sardis and Laodicea, the two that seem to be doing the best, neither of them were suffering persecution. Both were living relatively comfortable lives, and yet Jesus has nothing good to say to those churches. While the two churches that were suffering the most the two that were being persecuted and impoverished and burned at the stake and having little strength of their own, they were the ones that Jesus had nothing but good things to say things to. That was smart in Philadelphia, by the way. I'm telling you, it's no coincidence that that's how it is and that's the case with these churches and with many churches today. I'm telling you, we've got to be less concerned with comfort and more concerned about Christ's kingdom. A comfortable life does not necessarily reflect God's blessing and his approval in one's life. In fact, sometimes it's just the opposite. But that's not the message this morning. I just thought I'd throw that in there for you. Jesus begins by saying that he is the amen. I don't know if you're aware of it or not, but the word amen When you say it, for example, in a church service, it is a validation of something that is true. In fact, it is a a little transliteration of the Hebrew word truth. It it basically means properly firm. In in other words, uh, true, trustworthy. it's, It's like a sure foundation that you can place things on or that you can build things on. It is properly firm. That's what it means. And and that's why many times um, in in, in the middle of a message, when I make a statement of truth and all that I get in return are glazed over looks or blank stares or drool going down the side of your mouth, I myself will ask you a question with an amen of my own. The reason I do that is, is because I just want to make sure that somebody here can validate the truth that I just dropped in here. Somebody's picking up what I'm laying down. Amen. It's not so that I can have, you know, a cheering section in the church. It's not so that I can feel better better about the way that I preach. Listen, I just want to make sure that somebody, at least one person, gets the truth that was just presented to them. Amen. All right. On key. But it's a validation of something that is true. But notice Jesus doesn't say that he, he doesn't just say amen. He says that he is the Amen. He is truth. He is a sure foundation. He is properly firm. What he says is true. What he does is true. All his promises are true. Jesus is never, ever untrue. He is properly firm, solid truth. He validates all truth, Scripture tells us. He is the validation of all that God has promised to us, that they are true. He is the Amen. Notice he then emphasizes the fact that he is the amen. He emphasizes it by saying the faithful and true witness, which works in concert with the fact that he is the amen. Just as not one of God's promises will fail, so too has Jesus been ever faithful and ever true. He's a faithful and true witness. First Corinthians one twenty tells us for all the promises of God in him are yea and in him amen to the glory or unto the glory of God by us. Jesus is true. He is the amen, the faithful and true witness. And lastly, he claims in his introduction to be the beginning 
of the creation of God. Now, you got to be careful with this one. A lot of people taking this out of context. This does not suggest that Jesus was created by God. He is not a creation. Jesus is a creator. He is the creator. It reveals that he is the beginner and the author of God's creation. Of all God's creation, Jesus is the, beginning, the beginner and the author of them. That word beginning in, in the Greek is arche, and it means chief, arche. One rendering of it is literally A-R-C-H, arch, but arch. And it's probably a good way to understand this. Just like in a archway, think of that, in an archway, there is a center stone. It is called the keystone, and all the other stones in that archway, all the weight is pressing in upon it. But if you remove that keystone at the top, all those rocks will fall in upon themselves. And that is the picture here. Jesus is that solid foundation that holds it all together. He is the author of all creation. He is the creator of all things. Paul tells us that by him, all things consist. Hebrews 1.3 states that he is upholding all things by the word of his power. John 1.3 explains all things were made by him and, and without him was not anything made that was made. Colossians 1 gives us even greater detail behind this. It states, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For whom, by, or for by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. That's what it means when it says he is the beginning of the creation of God. He is the source, the originator of all creation, the beginning of it. And that is who it is that is speaking to this church in Laodicea. And let me just remind you, in case if you've forgotten, that's who it is that's speaking to us through his written word. He is the creator. So what does this creator have to say to this church? Look at verse 14. I'm sorry, verse 15. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Now this is where the understanding of the background, the history and the geography is essential for a proper understanding of this text. Jesus is not Contrary to popular opinion, Jesus is not saying to this church, you know, I just wish that you were either hot, that is on fire for me, or you were just cold. In other words, just not religious at all, not spiritual at all. But instead, what I find is you're lukewarm. You're a little bit of both this and that over there. He's not saying that. He's not saying, I I wish that you were for me or against me, but instead you're in the middle of the road and you're causing everybody a lot of confusion and you're leading a lot of people in the other direction. Though that may be true for a lot of cases, that's not what Jesus is saying here. When he says that they're lukewarm and that he prefer they be either hot or cold. They knew exactly what Jesus was saying to them. They got the message. You see, Laodicea was a was located along the Lycus Valley, which is great because a lot of people travel through the valleys. And with Colossae about 11 miles to the east and Hierapolis about six miles to the to the north, it was an extremely wealthy city. For a number of reasons, and we'll get into that later on in the message, but, but it became a center of banking and commerce, a center of finances. It was also located on what is called the, the Silk Road or the Silk Route, which was a major trade. It was also the cross-section of two trade routes that ran right through it. I mean, it was right there in the center of where everything was happening. And it became a popular town for wealthy Romans to retire to. So rich that after the, after the city was leveled by an earthquake in 60 AD, remember I made mention last week that it also runs along that major fault line that those other churches did. Well, it had an earthquake in 60 AD and it was leveled. And when that happened, the Roman government tried to assist them and give them some final financial support and they refused it. They said, we don't need your help. We don't want any help from outside sources. Instead, they rebuilt the city at their own expense, bigger and better than it was before. And after that, the fame of Laodicea just grew even greater and exponentially as they boasted of their self-sufficiency and their independence and their self-reliance. But as rich and as self-sufficient and self-reliant as this 
church or as a city of Laodicea was, they did not have the sufficient source of drinkable water. As rich as they were, they could not provide drinkable water. Uh, to the north, they had Hierapolis, which was famous for its natural hot springs, and it still is even to this day. You can go there and visit and sit in these, and they are naturally hot. In the East Colossae, they, they were known for the springs of refreshing cold water that you were able to just take and drink right there uh, uh, out of the river. The problem with the water that was the problem with piping in the water that was in Hierapolis is that well, that water is full of gases. And it's full of all kinds of chemicals and toxins that would cause your stomach to wrench if you tried to thirst it. No matter how thirsty you were, it would cause your stomach to, to kind of wrench so that you would just spit it back out if you tried to drink it. And the problem with piping in water from Colossae is that by the time it traveled that long distance, that the water would come through and it would be lukewarm by the time it actually arrived there. And also it would drop calcium deposits within the aqueduct system in which they built to get that water into the city. As sophisticated as their system is and it still remains today, you can see many of the remains uh, today, but they have, as sophisticated as it was, I mean, they developed the latest and the greatest with all the technology and all that money could buy. As sophisticated as it was, they still could not produce usable water for the city of Laodicea. Usable water. This is the message of Jesus to this church. Not, hey, either be with me or against me, but just don't be neutral. That's not the message. Instead, Jesus is telling him, listen, you are neither hot nor cold. You are neither good for healing and therapeutic purposes, and nor are you refreshing. And let me just tell you, as a church, we need to be at least one of those things, if not both of those things at, well, at, at a certain time. Amen? Amen? Healing and therapeutic to those who come here, and also refreshing, a breath of fresh air, a nice cold drink of water, that, hey, there are still people who love God and who worship God and who preach God's word. But Jesus says, you are neither one of these things. You are good for nothing. You are unusable water. The fact that Jesus states that he will spew them from his mouth, which is to vomit. Listen, that is not a threat. That is not his judgment. Oh, well, you're just so lukewarm. I'm, just like, I'm tired of you. It's not that. It was the fact that it, it, it produced, that water had the chemicals in there that it would produce this gut-wrenching effect that no matter what, you would spew it out if you tried to drink it. Even if Jesus was so thirsty to drink this church in and to use it for his purposes, he couldn't because of its lukewarmness. It was tepid, toxic, distasteful, and no one has use for that kind of water. And let me just tell you, there's no use for that kind of church. It's a vivid imagery that Christ is painting to demonstrate to this church that they have lost their purpose. And they are of no good use to the kingdom of God. Not in the state that they're in. Key phrase, not in the present state that they are in. And Jesus spells out the problem in verse 17. The problem, the cause of this lukewarmness. He says, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest not thou that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Because of the city's prosperity, because of its ability to produce its own wealth through several different industries and to make this money, and due to the widespread and the, uh, the overwhelming success that they had in that city, the citizens of the city had, a, had a, an attitude about them. And that attitude had crept into the church of Laodicea and it had infected the believers there. Self-sufficiency, personal independence, self-reliance are fatal blows to a church's and a believer's usefulness to the Lord. And the reason that is is because at the root of those things is pride. And the Bible is very clear that God resisteth the proud. When we are so comfortable with life, 
that we find ourselves, that we have stopped relying on God daily, on a daily, moment-by-moment basis, depending upon Him for provision, whether that be finances, whether that be for His protection, provision for good health, provision for food, or provision for our freedoms. When we are so comfortable that we don't even think about talking to God about those things because, well, we just got plenty of it. And instead, we have the idea, well, you know, our attitude is, well, it's okay. I'm good. Everything's good. Life's good. I don't need anything, God. I'm doing all right. I don't need to talk to you. But, but by the way, just in case, if I do need you, you'll be the first one that I'll come to when I'm in that need. Just nail the coffin shut because you're done. It's over with that attitude. This is the reason I believe why many people have not called out to God in quite a long while. Because they think they have all they need. Why call out to God? Why bother the church? Why bother the Lord? You know, I I believe that Satan, as us American Christians, figured out quite well. I think Satan, rather than stripping us of all that we have, and causing us to live in poverty, which, by the way, would force us to be reminded of our dependence upon God for these things. But instead, he has allowed us to live in relative comfort and abundance so that we forget that we constantly need to depend upon God for everything. And don't get me wrong, I think God has blessed us. But I also think the prince of the power there has been enabled to let us leave this life of comfort, to live it, and to get so accustomed to it that we don't even think about talking to God because our minds are on our dependence on Him. We got everything we need. You know, many of the structures that were rebuilt after this earthquake in Laodicea, they had this phrase, this Greek phrase written on it, ek ton ediom. Those three words, ek ton ediom, inscribed upon them, which means out of our own resources. Out of our own resources. And I believe that there are a lot of believers today who could say, or we could say, they have that same phrase inscribed upon their hearts. And because they have money in the bank, their bills are getting paid, and they got a good job, and they got a nice home because they live in a nice community and a nice neighborhood and they got a comfortable life. They, like this church, might be tempted to think inside. They'd never say, but inside, listen, I am rich. I am increased with goods and I have need of nothing. When Christ might save them, no, 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 no. You're wretched. You're miserable. You're poor. You're blind, you're naked, and you don't even know it. What a great temptation for us. Jesus is telling the Laodicean Christians, because you have these capabilities, uh, seemingly of your own doing. I know you think that you're the one who's making all this happen, but because you have these capabilities, To provide a comfortable life. First of all, he says, you have lost your sense of dependency on me. And secondly, you think you're all right. You are so deceived into thinking that you are okay because of these things. You're deceived into thinking that you must be doing well because you have all these things. When in reality, God would say, as it relates to you and me, and it comes to our relationship, you are in a pitiful condition. This is a great temptation for us. One that I believe that Satan takes full advantage of in our nation. Life's going good for you. Wow, God is really blessing you. Is he? Or has Satan asked permission to sift you as wheat? And Jesus is praying 
But I thought sifting was a bad thing. Oh, oh, he also has the ability to bless. So in verse 18, Jesus lists these three things that are required for the conditions to change in this church. And they are three analogies that he uses that, uh, that every one of them relates to the latest in culture. So in verse 18, the first thing he says is, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich. You see, they thought they were rich. Jesus said, no, you're not. But so that you may be rich, buy of me this gold. Remember, Laodicea was a, was a center of, of banking. When it came to gold, they had plenty of it. I mean, they had people coming in constantly, in, coming in and going out, and, and they were exchanging their gold for the merchandise that Laodicea could provide for them. And so they had gold coming in constantly on a daily basis. But Jesus isn't alluding to that kind of gold. He's alluding to a totally different kind, one that he refers to as a gold that is um, tried in the fire. But not even the kind of gold that we would have in this world that's tried by a fire. It's a pure gold than that. Purer than what any city in this world could produce. This is a reference, once again, to something that has an eternal value that will never fade or never pass away. So contrast this to what we've learned already in this series with the church of Smyrna. Who, although they were physically impoverished, I mean, the word used to describe them was homeless, remember? The beggars on the street, sitting on the corner, just begging, please, anything will help. They were in that condition. And yet Jesus looked at them and said, I know you think that you're impoverished, but you are rich. He was referring to heavenly wealth. Heavenly treasures, heavenly rewards. And likewise, this is similar. The kind of wealth that Jesus is counseling the church of Laodicea to buy of him, to purchase from him, that they may be rich. He's talking about spiritual, eternal rewards. Now, we know that the three things that he refers to here, by the way, and I know there's a lot of division over this, but these three things cannot be him referring to salvation because you cannot buy salvation. You cannot purchase salvation. It's number one, it's freely given. Number two, it's already been purchased by Jesus himself, by the blood of Christ. So we can't buy that. However, after salvation is received by an individual, and this is what I believe that he's alluding to here. After it is received by an individual, Scripture teaches us then that salvation is very costly. Amen. I, I said amen. That is a truth. Salvation is costly. In order to have its maximum effect, I mean, a maximum effect, which is basically not simply, you know, uh, delivering you and delivering your soul from hell, but also going beyond that and also you, you being used to lead others into salvation, to receive salvation. And thus they be delivered from the eternal judgment of their sin as well. It, listen, if you want that maximum value on the salvation that you have freely given, it's going to cost you something. It will. It may, you may lose some friendships. You may lose some business partners. You may leave, lose some contacts with your family. It'll cost you something. And then in order to have a life that lays up treasures, constantly stores up treasures in heaven, hey, that too is going to be costly. It demands a great sacrifice, a, de a denial of self, a willingness to put others first, even to love your enemies, and to acknowledge that we, we are not our own masters. Listen, you, you, do not, you are not the master of your own fate. We are not our own masters, but we have been purchased with a price. And I believe this is what Jesus is encouraging the Laodicean church to do. Get back to being usable. Get back to investing in eternal rewards and in an eternal kingdom and don't be so caught up in this earthly gold of yours. Instead, buy of me this heavenly gold. So many people, so many churches need to hear this message today. Get your eyes off the things of this world. Look at the things of eternity. 
second thing that Jesus counsels them to buy of him is white raiment. He says, in white raiment that thou mayest be clothed in the shame of thy nakedness, do not appear. Now Laodicea was also famous for a valuable, rare wool that they produced from the sheep that they raised there in the valley. And due to the high mineral compounds and the chemicals that were found in that soil, the sheep in this area grew a, a unique, glossy, black coat of wool, which they took and they made into fabrics and all kinds of different things. And the city was known. They were famous for this. In fact, many people, it was very costly, by the way, because of its rarity, but many of the people in, in living in the city, they wore garments that were made out of this black fabric to show off their prosperity, to show off, yeah, 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 I'm a local around here. I'm a citizen. I got, I got a whole closet full of these things. Well, they produce this, this black wool. We talked about this already in this series, but white raiment is a symbol of righteousness. White raiment is a symbol of righteousness. All throughout Revelation, John records about those who are in heaven. That is all the redeemed of the Lord, how they, they are pictured as wearing white robes, which we're told is the righteousness of the, of the saints. And, and of course, we understand the righteousness is not our own. Righteousness has been imputed to us through Christ as we stand before God. But there is a practical righteousness. There is a, a righteous lifestyle that we have to practice while we are down here. And the white robe refers to this, this, this kind of righteousness. Jesus, again, is compelling this church of his, this church in Laodicea, to be Christ-like, to clothe themselves in this righteousness, this righteous lifestyle, to follow after the example that he set, to walk in it and to live it out practically as an evidence of the imputed righteousness that they have received of Christ. As I think it was Brother John, uh, Brother John prayed earlier, that we not just you know, we hear about these things, we actually live them out. We actually are doers of the word. Well, Jesus is saying here, listen, actually live the faith that you have out. Put on this white robe. He's compelling them. Get back to where they used to be. Get back to where you, you started hot or you started cold and somehow you're in this spot. Get back to what you used to be. That righteousness is to be as a garment that we adorn all day, every day, so that others around us will be able to see that we live differently, we speak differently, we think differently, we act differently than the lost world. And that difference is it's supposed to be a good difference in their eyes. This too, by the way, will cost you. It'll cost you. So the third thing that Jesus counsels them to do is at the end of verse 18, he says, anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. Again, Jesus uses an analogy that was fit for this church in this city. In Laodicea, there was an important school of medicine located in the temple. And what did you know it? That the chief product, the thing that they were most famous for, was this eye salve, colorium, this eye salve that was able to cure all kinds of diseases of the eye. It didn't restore blindness, but it took care of a lot of the problems. And so people would flock and they would come because this, this, this stone, we read that it was made out of the Phrygian, I'm sorry, this, this, uh, this salve was made out of the Phrygian stones. They would break it up into powder and they would put it in this mixture. And, and, and so they would come here uh, to, uh, to Laodicea, to this, to this uh, place of, of medicine, the school of medicine, and they would purchase at high prices this, this salve and put it on their eyes. And they were famous for it. And Jesus takes advantage of that. And he calls them to apply his eye salve. No doubt that they would be able to see, that they'd be able to spiritually discern their condition, their lukewarmness. You know, I, I've said it before, and I, I'm going to say it again. It's the last time in this, mess, this series I can say it. Jesus speaks to us on our terms. He speaks to us so that we can hear him in the language that we understand, in the slang, uh, you know what I mean metaphorically, that we individually, based on what he's allowed us to go through our life, he can speak to me in a lot of different ways, and maybe he can speak to you, but he can get the same message across to you in another different way. And all throughout these letters, this is what we see God doing, and he's doing it right here with them. I think we all know of believers who have fallen away at one time and who during that period were unable to see themselves in a proper light. Amen? 
You know what I'm saying? They had fallen away for a time, and during that period, they did not even realize how far they had fallen. They did not see the wretchedness that they were involved in. They did not see the wickedness, how far they had, come, or they had fallen from where they once were. And you talk to them today, now that they have returned, and, and, and they say, yeah, I, I didn't even realize how low I had sunk. But for whatever reason, at that time, they had gotten away from God's house, and that led them to get away from God's people, and then eventually they got away from God's word, and it affected their ability to discern spiritual things, including their own wretched, poor, miserable, blind, naked state. And as we learned back in our study in 2 Peter, we know that when we do not uh, apply the spiritual things in our lives, it affects our vision. When we do not add to our faith, it affects the things that we're able to see spiritually. And Jesus offers this church of his, ISAF, to restore their spiritual discernment. So now notice what he says to this church, the lady see in verse 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Do you know what the Lord is saying here? Who is he speaking to here? You, you say, well, it's the latest in church. Duh. Well, yeah, but what is he saying about them, their identity? What, who is he saying that they are? Who is he referring to? Listen to Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 6. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. Yeah, we just heard that. Now notice this. And scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Solomon wrote in Proverbs 3, My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father, the son in whom he delighteth. Listen, Jesus says, I chasten those whom I love. He's discipling them. He's rebuking them. He's chastening them because he loves them because of who they are and the position that they hold, that they are the children of God. You don't go around chastening people who aren't your children. You better not anyway. You get a lawsuit nowadays. Oh, I got a belt. Let me just tell you. I'll take care of that. <laughs> but you do that with your own. And God chastens his own. Those whom he loves, he chasteneth. And that's what he is saying of this church right now. Believe it or not, they should be encouraged. Strangely enough, they should be comforted by the fact that Jesus is calling them out. As bad as things have gotten amongst the believers that are laid to see it, Jesus still calls them and treats them. Listen now, his church. He still says, I know, man, you, I, I get it, but you're still my church. There's still believers there. He didn't give up on them. And they were not so far gone that Jesus just let them die in a bed of their own making. To be chastened by Christ is evidence of being loved by Christ. To be chastened by Christ is to be loved by Christ. My children have yet to figure this out. And they probably never will until they have their own children. And then their children will figure it out. And I'll laugh at them, but that's beside the point. But as a father, I chasten my children because I love them. I chasten them. Now listen, there's a purpose behind the chastening. It's not to get, you know, to vent and to, to get some anger out. I chasten them in hopes that because of the chastening, it will cause them to turn around and get back on the right path. To stop doing what they were doing and to get to doing the right things. And let me just tell you, just as God, or just as we do that, God hopes to turn us back when he chastens us. He hopes to put us right back in the right direction again. That because of the, the, the pressure and the chasing and the disciplining, that we would come to our senses and say, you know what, this is not comfortable. I'm going to get back to where I need to be. It's called Repentance. The goal of chastening is so that we would be zealous to turn around, to correct our course, because we don't like chastening. It's not pleasant. It's not fun. It's not enjoyable. It doesn't feel good. And so that right there is an incentive to be zealous, to quickly get back where we need to be. And that's why he says, be zealous, therefore, and repent. I know these things are happening with you, but be zealous, therefore, repent. 
They're happening because I'm trying to goad you back into the place where you need to be. I'm, I'm spanking you so you feel that, that little pressure on your behind there. So you say, you know what? I need to get back to doing what I need to do and not go back there again because that's painful. The purpose for chastening is to get us to repent. Listen, I just really don't get it. I don't understand why believers would continue to remain in a period and in a time of chastening and discipline in their lives rather than just turning around and going back to where you know you need to be. What possesses them to stay there, to think that that's, in, that that's normal? I mean, was it really that bad? When you were walking closely to the Lord, I mean, was, was life really all that bad? And what are you gaining now that makes the chastening that you're enduring worth it? Would you rather not be at peace with God? Would you rather not have the peace of God? I don't understand. But Jesus says to that person, be zealous. Repent. Quickly. Turn around. Now that we have the context in our minds, take a look at verse 20. Behold. So, so he's feeding off of be zealous and repent. Behold. Be zealous and repent. Now look, pay attention here. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I just want you to understand this is not an evangelistic verse in context. This is not Jesus, you know, knocking on the door of your heart and, and he just really wants to come in and if you just open the door, he'll come in and he'll save you. That's not here. That's a great image. I get it, but that's not what Jesus is painting here. He is not talking to a group of lost people. He's talking to a group that is his church. A wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, lukewarm church, but a church nonetheless. And he says to them, Pay attention. I'm at the door. I'm knocking. I, I don't care what you've done and how far you've gone. You know what? You open that door, I will come in. And the tragedy of this image is that Jesus has been shut out of his own church. He who has redeemed them, they are now keeping on the outside. The one who died for this church is now excluded from it. The one who conquered death and hell to win them now stands at this church desiring to be invited back into their presence. He is a faithful groom. They're the unfaithful bride. He isn't the one who's committed the wrong, and yet he's the one outside the church door knocking, trying to seek restor restoration. And he doesn't kick the door in. He won't force himself in. I'm telling you, it isn't right. And this isn't fair that he's the one doing it. We should be on our hands and knees, crawling up mountains, bloody knees and elbows, and just crying our hearts out, God, please take me back. But instead, he's the one outside the door. That's the love of Christ. I read a meme, yeah, a meme of all things, that said it sounds a little ridiculous that Jesus would leave the 99 to go get the one until you're the one. This is the love of Christ. Regardless of how far Laodicea had fallen from Jesus, he says, if anyone will just open the door, I will come in and sup with him. Meaning he will restore that fellowship once again. The fellowship that was broken will be right back where we were. The word sup was a reference to the evening meal. It was the final meal of the day where they would gather together. It's not like our dinners today, you know, grab and go. They would gather together and they would sit and they would eat. And it generally took hours, a couple of hours at least. Every single day they would have this meal together. It was a time of family, a time of fellowship, a time of reflection, and a time of food. And this is what Sup is referring to. Jesus, Jesus is ready to restore fellowship with these in the church immediately as soon as they open the door. 
No questions, no ifs, ands, or buts. No, well, now, before I come in and sit down with you, I want you to explain this. No, 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 he says, okay, you, you, you be zealous, repent, turn back, open the door. I'll come in. We'll be right back. Verse 21, Jesus makes another promise. And this one relates to eternity. This is great. To him that overcometh, Will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcome and am set down with my Father in his throne? This is a promise to all true believers, those who overcome, even as Jesus overcome. He says, we've already studied this through the series. We're not going to go through it all over again, but we know how we overcome. We overcome through the blood of the Lamb. We become overcomers. Why? Because we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's what 1 John tells us, 1 John 5. We are the overcomers. This is a promise to all true believers. He promises to grant these or us to sit with him in his throne. What does that mean? I don't know exactly. I don't think any of us can definitely say everything that it means, but we know this. We know that Christ's throne is a place of authority and power and rule. And it appears that Jesus is once again reminding us that we will rule and reign with him one day. And we've already, again, talked about it in previous sermons here, but the overcomers of this age, we know at least the overcomers of this age, I don't know about everybody else, but I do know this much based upon Scripture, the overcomers of this age, we will have a unique role. We will have a unique place, to, a, a, a part to play in Jesus' kingdom. We will rule and reign with him. Maybe this is just another promise of that, a reminder of the promise but now consider everything that we studied. Consider the group that he's saying this in front of. It's the same promise, kind of a little bit of di- different detail, but he's saying it painted on the backdrop of a lukewarm church. I think Henry Morris hit it on the head. He stated, what an amazing manifestation of God's grace. Those who are about to be spewed from his mouth are invited to sit with him on his throne. What an amazing manifestation of his grace. I'm telling you, we are living in the land of Laodicea. We also live in a place where we have an abundance of these three same basic necessities of life. I mean, if you break it all down, this is what it comes to. We have the exact same, an abundance of these things, money, materials, and medicine. It is so easy for us to forget our desperate need. I I get it. We all would say, oh yeah, I need God daily. I need him every day. But this is a desperate need that we have for him. It's so easy for us to forget that we desperately need him. Rather than depending upon him, we begin to depend upon those things. We think, well, as long as I have those things, we're okay. As long as I have those things, we're all set. Wait a second, wait a second. As long as I have God, I'm all set. And he'll give me what I need. If I don't got it, then I don't need it right now. As long as I have those, we're set. We forget our desperate need that we have for him. Until those things run low in our life or are taken away, then we remember who the real source is of all things. Lord, help us. Help us not to lose our desperate dependence on God and fall into this trap of thinking that we are self-sufficient and we don't need to go to God desperately every single day on a day-to-day basis, moment by moment, to be with God, to talk with God, to worship God, to live for God. I see it. You see it. Things start going good in people's lives and they become scarce. God rips the They rug right out from under them, and guess what? They're back here at the altar crying out, God, I desperately need you. We do not 
We do not need to be a lukewarm church. Let's be hot. Let's be cold. Let's never lose our dependence upon God. Let's never lose our purpose, our usefulness as his church. We completely, solely depend upon him for everything. We do not have all that we need in the sense of, well, I don't need God anymore, but I have all that I need in the sense of what I need is what God's given to me. And Jesus says, those I love to chasten, or those I love, eh, I love to chasten, that's wrong. Those I love, I chasten. If you're feeling beat up, if you're feeling raked over the coals because of this message, this letter, your heart is under conviction, take that as a sign. Jesus loves you. He's not giving up on you. But he is knocking. And he's waiting for you to open the door. Amen? Amen. Just stand to your feet, close your eyes. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches.